Part 1. You are going to hear a conversation between Angela and Mr. Ray. Angela is applying to join the library. Listen to the conversation and complete the form below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording a second time. Hello. How can I join the library? Well, you need to make an application. Would you like to do it now? Yes, if I can. One moment and I'll get the form. Now, I just need to ask you a few questions before you sign at the bottom. Okay. Your full name, please. Angela Mary Price. Price? Yes, that's right. Okay. And your address? Apartment 3, 86 Bridge Street, Pimlico. Bridge Street? That's just near here, isn't it? Yes, not very far. Good. So the postcode must be 2065, right? Yes, that's right. Now, your telephone number. I need both home and work if you have them. My home number is 8763-5142. And work is 8456-1307. Do you need anything else, like ID or something? Yes, your driver's license will do, if you have one. Right. It's easy to remember. I know it by heart. 4040AC. I'm afraid I'll also need to see it. Okay. Here it is. Thanks. And your date of birth, please? 24 March 1981. Okay. Thanks. That's the most important part completed. But if you don't mind, I'd also like to ask you a few questions for a survey we're conducting. Yes, that's okay. Now you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. As the conversation continues, answer questions 6 to 10. What kind of books do you like to read? Here's a list to look at. Oh, it varies from time to time, but I always like to relax and learn about other countries I might visit one day. I don't like anything too heavy or serious, unless it's about animals or the environment. I'm not really into sport very much. Anything else? Well, I do like entertaining at home. You know, dinner parties. So I suppose you'll have something for me in that line. The pictures in those books always make me hungry, although they never seem to turn out exactly as they look in the books. Fine. I think that's all I need now, except I need you to sign here on the application form. Oh, and I almost forgot. The membership fee is $20, which is refundable if you no longer stay a member. There you are. Do I sign at the bottom here? Yes, that's right. You can borrow books now if you wish, although your membership card won't be ready until next week. So if you want to borrow today, you can pick up your card when you return your first books. That's if you want to take some now. I think I will, but I'll have a look around first. Okay. Take your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the Scottish Highlands. First, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 18.
Today I have with me Moira McKenzie, the author of several books in a well-known series of travel guides, and she'll be talking about what is probably the most fascinating wildlife area in Europe, the Scottish Highlands. Moira. Yes, that's right. And it's a wonderful place to visit with lots to do in an area that makes up over half of Scotland. Including the 790 islands that lie scattered around the coast, it covers 39,000 square kilometres. Getting there is easy. From here in Glasgow, a good starting point is Fort William on the west coast, with regular bus and rail services linking the two. I'd recommend the train, which takes four hours to get there. Alternatively, you can take the Highland Line, which takes the more easterly route up to Inverness. That, in fact, is a bit quicker, taking around three and a half hours to cover the 280 kilometres from here. There are also two main options by road. You can take either the A9 up through Stirling and Perth and then on to Inverness, or else on the west there's the A82 which runs up to Fort William and then, if you want, on to Inverness. Now, a lot of people associate the Highlands with bitterly cold weather, but in fact the region has a generally mild climate as a result of being surrounded on three sides by sea, particularly the warm waters of the Atlantic. At sea level in the west, for instance, the temperature ranges on average from a minimum of 1 degree centigrade in January up to 18 in July, and you can actually see palm trees growing there. Obviously, though, the temperatures will be lower inland and on higher ground. You can expect it to rain a lot too, particularly in the west, where annually as much as 2,000 millimetres regularly falls, though this helps account for the rich variety of vegetation and wildlife. When you get there, you'll find there are plenty of reasonably priced places to stay. In Fort William, for instance, you can find a room for the night in a small hotel or a bed and breakfast for just £25, or for £28 to £30 in Inverness. It's probably a good idea to book ahead, though, especially in the summer months. With all the leisure, sports and cultural activities on offer, the towns are becoming increasingly popular with visitors. For example, accommodation in Inverness won't be at all easy to find this year around the 23rd of July, as that's when the local Highland Games will take place. So, if your aim is to see the countryside, it may be best to stay in a small village. Now you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. As I mentioned, there's a huge range of wildlife in the Highlands, but for those visiting the area, there are some basic ground rules that are essential if we are to protect it. Firstly, you should make every effort not to disturb birds and animals, and one way of doing this is to blend in with your surroundings, for instance by avoiding brightly coloured garments, such as orange anoraks. To see wildlife clearly, it's best to use binoculars, keeping your distance. This is particularly important during the breeding season. Wherever possible, use a hide so that they are less likely to detect your presence. Surprising though it may seem, visitors are advised to use their cars where no purpose-built hides are available, as people are apparently less likely to startle animals if they stay inside their vehicles. You may even find that creatures come up close to where you're parked, in which case, wait until they've gone before you move off. It should really go without saying that it's essential to be as quiet as possible, though sadly, some people need reminding of this. Oh, and one other thing. 
Wild animals and pets don't mix. So please leave your dog at home or at least somewhere he or she can't chase the wildlife or damage their habitat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between students Maria and Jack. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about their opinions about some of the things in their universities. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Two four one four double three one. Good afternoon. May I speak to Jack Robert, please? Speaking, please. Hi, Jack. This is Maria. Hello, Maria. How are you getting on there? Fine. I arrived in Nottingham yesterday. I've just settled down and I live on the campus of Nottingham University. Oh, that's good. Do you like the campus? Yes, it's beautiful. What do you think of yours? Edinburgh University? It's marvellous. It's on a hill and very close to the sea. I like it very much. It sounds beautiful. Jack, what's the weather like there? Oh, it's fine and sunny. It's said that the weather here is very nice in summer, but awful in winter. What's the weather like in Nottingham? Well, it's a bit depressing. It's been raining since yesterday. I can't go out, so I have to stay in my room. What about your room? Is it a nice one? Yes, it's small and elegant. How about yours? Mine is an ordinary one. It's a twin study room. I share it with one of my classmates. He's intelligent and very friendly. We're getting on quite well. How's your roommate? She's very nice, but a little bit quiet. She likes reading and seldom speaks. By the way, do you like the Scottish food there? Oh, I like it. It's very delicious. Oh, really? I don't like the food here. It's disgusting. It has no taste. I have to cook for myself in my room. Well, Maria, as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Come on, don't be too choosy. Oh, someone's at the door. I have to answer it, Maria. I'll call you this evening. Bye. Bye. Ellen, a student union officer, is conducting a survey about the university facilities. She is asking two students about their opinions. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm Alan and I work for the Student Union. Now, I'd like to hear your opinions about a few things in the university. We've asked for some volunteers to help us conduct this survey into how satisfied students are with the university facilities. 
First of all, let's take the lecture rooms. We could score them, for instance, 1 is excellent, 2 satisfactory, 3 rather poor, and 4 really bad. Robert, you first, please. What do you think about the lecture rooms here? Not so good, I'm afraid. I would score 3. They're too small for one thing. Sometimes we can hardly find a seat. Yes, but that doesn't happen very often. Personally, I think they're all right. They're comfortable, and the acoustics are quite reasonable. It doesn't matter where you sit, you can always hear the lecture. I would give two for them. How do you feel about the car parking facilities? Are they adequate? You must be joking! I can never find a car parking space when I need one, and when I finally do, it's a very long walk to the university's teaching building. I'd give it a four. I'm afraid I also agree. We need more car parks urgently. This is perhaps one of the major shortcomings of this campus. It gets a four from me as well. I come to the university 20 minutes early, just so I can drive around looking for a parking space. What about the computer centre then? I think it's first class. The software base contains a large selection of learning programmes, language games and word processing facilities. I would give a score of one. I quite agree with you. It's very modern and also under the supervision of qualified staff who can offer help to us while we work, should we need them. Oh, good. Well, what do you think of the library facilities? Let's say the periodical room first. Well, I've scored that three. I'm sorry to have to say, but, er, uh, I think the room has poor lighting, and I'm disappointed about that. I've given it a score of one. As far as I'm concerned, it's excellent and well stocked. Thank you, Robert and Mary. Now, let's turn to the photocopying facilities. Hmm, I would give it a score of two. Personally, I think it's all right and it's very helpful. Huh? I would score three. I think it's too expensive for photocopying and there are not enough machines. Sometimes we have to stand in a line. OK. Now, let's talk about the... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. 
These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers, fishing crews, and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. 100 years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer, they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter, they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard-packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six-meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian. Some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29% and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns and housing provided by... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.